So sorry, you missed a scintillating first few minutes on, on polling, folks who are watching on our YouTube channel. And a discussion about Susan Delacourt's piece on the latest polling number that was in the uh, Toronto Star today. Moving on now. I guess it's time. we've heard enough of the music. I think we've heard enough of the music, so I'll shut that down. You know, it's a challenge, Bruce, to be the sole operator of this program. You know, I should give you part of the job, right? You should do the music or do the remember to push the record button. I'll do the music. I like uh, I like you making mistakes. It makes me feel a little bit better about myself. <laughs> so let's, let's stick with that. Okay, Don Braid writes in Alberta and has on politics in Alberta and the national picture for, as I said earlier, decades. Um, I haven't talked to Don in probably 20 years, uh, but I, we used to have him on every once in a while uh, when I was uh, back in my old CBC days. And I still read Don. I know you read Don quite often too. Don't always agree with him, but uh, he has a really interesting piece that's just out in the last few days. I'll just read the first three sentences because they're quite telling. Forget about what others say about Alberta politics. Listen to what Don Braid says. And he's been watching Alberta politics since, I think, since the Lougheed days. Talks between Ottawa and many Alberta groups on job transition have been going on since 2019 behind the back of the Alberta government. But it was the UCP, it's the governing party in Alberta, that turned its back while Alberta business, Alberta labor, Alberta municipalities, and Alberta interest groups got fully engaged. This almost guarantees that a new national job strategy will be designed without the provincial government that has the deepest interest in the result. Um, that's pretty telling. And it's not just about Danielle Smith. It's about Jason Kenney because he's makes the point. This has been the case since, since 2019 that Alberta is basically checked out of these discussions or the Alberta government has checked out of these discussions, but all the other, or many of the other interested parties in Alberta, whether it's industry or municipal governments, what have you have been a part of the process. What do you take? Yeah. Well, it's a very timely, uh, very, very welcome uh, column. You know, I, I, I remember saying something like this in one of our conversations in the last several weeks, you know, that that <clears throat> there is a, a version of Alberta that is different on these issues than that which emanates from the premier's office. And I know that I always hesitate to say those kinds of things because I, I think you, you get mail that says, what does a guy from central Canada know about Alberta and everything else? But it has been clear to me for a good while that um, people in Alberta uh, are very savvy. They're very knowledgeable. They're like everybody else. They can see the change that's happening in the world. They know that it will come, there will come a time when um, Processing oil without regard to your emissions doesn't work. Your investors won't support it. Customers won't buy it. Um, and so they want to get on with that. They know that there will come a time when the use of the resource, once you produce it with lower emissions, um, will transition from burning for energy to some burning for energy, but a lot of other uses as well. Um, and Nowhere more than in Alberta, Saskatchewan a close second, is it more necessary for there to be smart public policy that says, okay, if we see this coming and we're completely convinced that this is the headwind that we are going to be facing, what do we do about that? And to know that the answer isn't to blame Ottawa or to pretend that it's not coming. Um, that, you know, that's been the problem in, in my view in Alberta conservative politics for several years is that they, they wanted to have the fight with Ottawa because of some almost a continuation of the old NEP fight with Justin Trudeau's father. 
because it felt good in their political DNA. Because occasionally the federal government talked about this transition in a way that sounded um, somewhat presumptuous, offensive, overlording, that kind of thing. The conversation has been broken at the political level for a long time. But behind the scenes, including some of the politicians involved, there's some very, very constructive people who are working away at what would it look like? How would we support each other? Um, there's a lot of dimensions to this, uh, one of which is um, the idea that we're going to need more electricity in this country. We're going to need a bigger, more robust pan-Canadian electricity grid to get the clean energy to the people who need to use it for all the new things that they need to use it for. That's only going to happen if the federal government, the provincial governments, and lots of different industrial and labor stakeholders come together. And I think more and more of those players are seeing it that way. And I'm really glad that Don Braid wrote it. I believe that these internal dynamics in Alberta, as, as revealed to some degree by the comment in, in that Braid column of, the, of Alex Pourbet, the CEO of Synovus, who made it clear that um, Canada's best chance for success is in, in creating this dynamic where our barrels are cleaner and our, our resources are used for more things and that that's the way that we should be thinking about our economy in the future. But very welcome uh, and very timely. And timely also uh, because Danielle Smith has has seemed to offer the opportunity to to get into some of this discussion uh, with Justin Trudeau, where she wasn't as little as a week or two ago. So Look, I, I'm all for them developing a relationship where they can work this out. Um, it feels a little bit to me like she's. Um, stuck in a place where there's probably some people in her caucus who don't accept the science of climate change and don't want her to go down this road at all. Um, she's kind of put herself in uh, such a, a kind of a rigid and combative posture vis-a-vis -vis Trudeau, including over uh, the, the Transition Act um, in the first go-round, that it sounds a bit... Um, jerky almost to kind of get to the place that she is now almost as though she was sort of reminded or learned about some of these the, some of these consultations that have been going on some of the work that have been going on and decided well I better not be behind that curve and that's the way that Don Braid ended his call is it better it's better to be driving this car than parked in the garage um, and I think that's maybe where she is. I hope it is. I really feel like the chance for um, a breakthrough of let's focus on the right ideas rather than a repeat of the old politics um, is possible. Can you, just before we move on, can you explain to me why there is a, a hesitancy or disapproval of the use of the term just transition? And that's not just in Alberta. That's also around the some of the cabinet table in Ottawa, that they felt that was an unnecessary use of those two words and that it's created some of the problem. Yeah. I think the word transition alone isn't, isn't a problem. I think attaching the term just to it has a connotation uh, that is more like a soft landing or a social program uh, to kind of heal the wounds of people affected by this transition. Um, and I, I think where it came from was from the international labor movement, essentially, who wanted to make sure that the treatment of workers as opposed to corporations in the energy transition was handled in a just fashion. In other words, to make sure that companies didn't, didn't kind of wander away from those businesses and nobody was taking care of the needs and opportunities for the employees. That language fit more comfortably in a conversation like that. Um, but in the conversation like, like the one that happens between Alberta and Ottawa on energy, just transition has a connotation of something that maybe Ottawa is going to do to Alberta as opposed to something that Alberta is going to want to do and Ottawa is going to help it do, which is probably the right place for this to be at some point. Not sure if we'll get there, but feel a little bit more optimistic now than I have in a long, long time. 
maybe ever on that issue. And I think the use of the word just is, um, it's not like people don't like the word because they want to be unjust. It's that they, it sounds more like a social program uh, connotation, which implies maybe in the end, it's not going to be very good, but we'll try to make it just. So I think, the, you know, the semantics of these things um, can matter in these conversations. Maybe it seems like in an outsized way, but that's my take on where that phrase is and why it's it, making people want to wander away from it. Okay. Um, before we move on to this issue of the uh, consulting, uh, which will be our final segment for, for this day, can I just remind those who are watching this on our YouTube channel, uh, that you missed the first 15 minutes or so, not because of some technical screw up, not because of some conspiracy, but because I screwed up. The director, the director didn't the director, turn the button I, on. I forgot to push a button, uh, which were uh, recorded, but it's a pretty good conversation about the, uh, uh, the mess the liberals find themselves in when they uh, look at the latest polling data, which shows them at eight points down from the conservatives and has a lot of people wondering whether they can ever come back from that number. Um, so, if you want to listen to that discussion, you can find it by just downloading the podcast. Um, so it's there. So I'm sorry, I, you know, my fault. My bad, as they say. Um, and can I thank you, Bruce, for earlier talking about how back in the day when, when I was covering campaigns as a, as a reporter, that you did include the fact that I was on planes. Because, you know, some people might think I was on horseback or on a train or something that it was so long ago, but it, it was, it was early planes. First one I was on, I think it was a DC seven was a prop prop plane. Uh, however, I digress. Let's move on to consulting. The committee hearings in Ottawa start today and they got a pretty big witness on day one, which is Dominic Barton, the former Canadian ambassador to China, but more importantly, for the purposes of these conversations on consulting, the former managing partner worldwide of uh, the McKinsey Group, which has had a big target painted on its back, some of it for good reason, as Barton admitted when he was on this podcast last week. Anyway, there's a lot of discussion around consulting and whether or not it's gone too far in governments, you know, throughout the Western world and including Canada, where I think, I think it's something like $100 million in consulting fees last year or whatever, a lot of money anyway, from a time when there used to be very small consulting figures, kind of started, started to balloon up during the Harper years, it's gone on uh, in, the, uh, in the Trudeau years. What do you, um, I mean, you know some of these players, you know what they do, and you know the argument about whether or not they're going to end up replacing or have already replaced the work, good work, in many cases, that uh, public servants and the bureaucracy do. Um, where do you think this committee's going to lead to? What could it achieve in these talks? A lot of smoke. Um, you know, I don't know if there's... I, I obviously don't know the details of all... And that sort of thing. But my assumption is that I haven't seen anything that makes me think that anything was done that was inappropriate so far. But I do see lots of things that in the hands of a relatively talented opposition politician can rile Canadians. Um, and I think that's where we're at right now. And subject to more information coming out, that may change. Why, why is it turning out like this? Well, the first thing I would say is that the use of the term consultants is, is a broad brush that encompasses a lot of things. That If we think about the way our society works now, a lot of small and medium businesses, sized businesses, use consultants to help them with IT, to help them with their financial management software, to help them with uh, the processes by which they source uh, things or ship things. It, it, so if there was a version of the economy when more businesses just had all of the resources that they needed inside, that was some time ago. Um, so consulting as a, as a way to tap into expertise 
um, that has experience doing something that maybe your competitors are doing and you want to know about and you want to incorporate into your business, that's a pretty cost efficient model to get that expertise. And that's a big part of what consultants do. They've done digital transformations in a variety of organizations. And so a government department can say, we should have done that five years ago. We got to get on with it. What's the best practice? What's the best way to do this? So we're not inventing it from scratch. And it would be, um, it would be a bad deputy minister ADM if they didn't look at consultants as a way to help identify the best practice that they should follow. And in many cases, use those consultants to design the system that they need. Um, because you can't attract that kind of talent and experience for the kind of dollars that government pays. I, I hear Pierre Polyev talk about expensive consultants and he, he he's going to want to make people think that these professionals are ripping off Canadians, and some Canadians undoubtedly will think that. But um, we don't like to pay our public servants the kind of money that somebody who knows how to do these things and has done them in a variety of different settings can make in the private sector. So we just have to decide whether we don't want the expertise or we're willing to pay for it in some of these situations. I'm not saying that's the case in everyone. But I'm saying that is the general rationale for that. And then there's another category of um, support that is acquired from these consultant co consulting companies that can also be a very rational decision for governments to make, which is that if you have a project that's a limited term and requires a lot of um, a lot of concentrated labor, you can either decide that you're going to try to hire those workers. And then when the project is done, send them on their way, or you can contract them through an outside party, sometimes a consulting firm, to do that work because it doesn't give you the same kind of payroll bulge, headcount increase, uh, and long-term commitment that you otherwise don't want. So that can be also uh, one of the categories of spending under these consulting budgets that um, departments have enlarged over the years. And I'm hoping that in the course of these hearings, that um, a good explanation, and I would say a good defense, um, but a good explanation of how consulting materially helps improve uh, government services and programs or can help save tax dollars, both of which I think um, are often the case. Okay. I hope that that argument comes out. Well, let me just throw a, a counter argument at you on, on one level, but first, Early in your answer, you talked about how there's no evidence of anything wrong happening. And I know you were talking about Canada when you made that point. Because yeah. it's pretty clear there were there have been some pretty ugly things that have happened around the world. Barton admitted it. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, week, absolutely. Yeah. The whole opioid thing scandal in the States, which Ginsey's ended up paying $600 million mm -hmm. uh, to uh, affected parties as a result, was a bad thing. But if there are bad things in the Canada relationship with consulting firms, then they may come up in these hearings. Perhaps the opposition parties have something they want to put forward, and you know everybody will be intrigued to hear that. Here's my question, though, my other, my kind of counter question to your argument. Part of the criticism of consulting firms is that when they're hired by, let's say, a government to help them figure out a way to get from A to B, that B is going to be the destination, no matter what, no matter whether the consulting firm sees, you know, actually A to C would be a better way to go than A to B. In other words, what you're hiring is somebody to back up your desire to do something a certain way. Find the reasoning that'll work to go from A to B, if you will. Uh, and other options aren't on the table. I don't know whether I explained that well enough, but if I did, does that make any sense? Is there is that part of the reason why questions are being raised about these relationships? Yeah. Well, I've worked with a lot of organizations in the private sector, big companies who use consultants. Um, and sometimes they use consultants because they 
they can have really smart people inside their organizations, but those people are defensive about continuing to do the things that they're doing the way that they're doing them. Where at the more senior management levels, um, leaders can be looking at their competitor set and saying, well, those guys over there seem to be doing it a little bit better. Why don't we figure out what it is that they're doing and see if some version of that should be incorporated here? If you follow the logic of that and you bear in mind the human chemistry uh, that's involved in organizational dynamics, um, it makes sense that sometimes you can't get that kind of uh, agile and flexible thinking out of your own organization alone. Sometimes you can, but sometimes you can't. And that if you bring in outside consultants and they uh, try to drive towards a change that they're asked to explore and explain how to do, that it's going to cause some um, bumping inside, that there's going to be some friction, there's going to be some tension. I've always sort of looked at it and say, it's pretty messy sometimes to see it, um, but sometimes that friction is productive in an organization. Sometimes it creates you know, more uh, dynamic change, more positive change than otherwise would happen. I'm not here to make a complete blanket defense of consulting. My point is really, I don't think anybody is right now, and I don't, I don't think that's right. I think it's quite easy to say consultants, just as it has been easy in the past to say lobbyists, and to imply that uh, whether it's the head of the Canadian Medical Association or the lobbyist for uh, opioid manufacturers, they're the same. They're not the same. Um, all these situations are not the same, and in some cases, they're you know, consultants do very effective work um, that's useful for governments. All right. We're going to leave it there for this week. Uh, with apologies once again to our uh, YouTube channel viewers, uh, but you can pick up that first 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, there was fairly a uh, deep dive on the, the situation the liberals find them in. So we'll in. have to get a consulting company to come in and help yeah. us with this. Uh, yeah, that's a good idea. I'll get right on that. And of course, we've got the millions of dollars here at the bridge to afford one of those top consulting companies. Sell some of that memorabilia behind you. They can That's auction right. it off for you. It's probably a service that you can acquire too. It's my dad's Lancaster during the Second World War. Uh oh, sorry. Flying for the RAF. And I think that's a, uh, I'm not sure. I got to check which plane that is. Well, no, I'm glad you're not wearing the tube today so we can see it more clearly. <laughs> All right, my friend, good to talk to you. We'll talk again soon. Uh, tomorrow, it is your turn and the Random Ranter. Friday, Bruce will be back with Chantel for good talk. That's it for this day. I'm Peter Mansbridge on Smoke, Mirrors, and the Truth. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching at least part of it. And we'll talk to you again in 24 hours.